Come on and give God praise as you take your seats. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. How are we doing this morning? Amen. Praise the Lord. I hope you are uh, excited. Uh, yesterday, well, let me say this. Can we, can we put our hands together and praise God for uh, David and Tammy uh, Forrester? Amen. Amen. Some of you may or may not uh, know them. Uh, yesterday, uh, God opened up the door uh, for us as a church uh, to marry them, to join them as, as husband and wife. And what an honor. Uh, some of you may or may not know them. And Tammy, I've known for a few months now. And David, uh, David and I have been uh, friends uh, ever since Pursuit. I was the men's pastor over there. And David and I, we just took a liking uh, to one another. And I remember uh, when Jesus saved his life, uh, came into his heart, and, and one day he approached me, and I knew uh, there was something different about David, and uh, he had been saved, and he had been uh, touched by the Lord. He'd had an encounter with Jesus Christ, and he showed up, and he said, listen, man, I don't even know why I'm asking you what I'm asking you. I don't even uh, know why I'm saying what I'm saying, but would you be willing to baptize me? And I said, man, are you serious? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I not only uh, have had the opportunity to baptize uh, Brother David, but yesterday I also got to marry him. And that, I mean, two of the most, probably two of the most important days of his life. And me personally was a blessing uh, in my life. And as a church, it is, I think, something uh, really worth giving God praise and adoration for. Uh, we don't really see a marriage, and, and not my message, I know I do this a lot, but I, I feel the Lord uh, really saying something. But we, I don't think as a people today in America, I really value marriage the way uh, God has intended marriage to be valued. You know, today uh, we've got, you know, women or wives that as soon as they get a tired of uh, uh, one husband, they kind of wash their hands with them. And when the husband is tired of his wife, they, you know, let's just, let's just call it quits. I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. It gets hard. And it's almost like marriages and relationships now uh, are more uh, like turnkey. And I, and I say turnkey because we, when we go into it, we expect everything to be ready, everything to be built, everything to be constructed. But there's a blessing in husband and wife. The Bible says that they leave their natural mothers and fathers and they come together and they twain, the Bible says, and become one flesh. And if you ask me in my biblical opinion, natural earthly marriage between man and woman only is still one of the greatest earthly representations of the triune God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Bible says, are one. Man and woman, husband and wife are to become one. And the thing yesterday that I really wanted to reiterate uh, to them is not to necessarily build their marriage upon love, but the love of Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me? Because we, we've taken love and we say, man, you know, we, we, love, we love country music. We love Publix fried chicken. We love cars that go fast. And then we say we love our husbands and wives and put uh, all those things that we love in the same category as that love. But when we talk about the love of Jesus Christ, the love of Jesus Christ is not only sacrificial, but it's unconditional. Are you hearing me? And to love someone without condition means even when sickness hits your body, I still love you like the day that we got married. Even if an accident or you're bound uh, to a wheelchair or you're not able to do the things that you used to do, it's okay. Even when you lose your hair and you look like uh, Brother Cliff and it starts to go and you get gray and you gain a little weight and gravity runs its course, I still love you like the day that we got married. And I believe that we need more marriages just like that. Amen? Amen. Listen, 
Go ahead and do me a favor really quickly, and I don't want to be long. I, I really uh, want to open up the door uh, to worship uh, the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, but turn with me this morning to the 21st chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew. And listen, while you are getting there, if this is your first time tuning in with us online, I don't believe it's accidental. And if this is the first time that you're here in the house of God this morning, I greet you in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ. As some of you may or may not know, but last Last week and today and even uh, next Sunday, we have been preaching and ministering around the theme and the reality that what? Jesus is King. Can we say that together? Ready? One, two, three. Jesus is King. All right. And that's not an idea. That should be a reality. Because when we begin to understand that Jesus is king, he can give us hope in a world that's, that does not have hope. As Jesus is, if Jesus is my king, regardless of the mountain that stands before me, regardless of the trial that I'm in right now, regardless of the tribulation that's laid before me, it does not matter because I know who my father is, Jesus is king. And that is what I live by every single day is the reality that Jesus is king. And you know that we are now entering into what uh, most believe and consider and, 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 and is considered to be Passion Week. And we are we're in Palm Sunday celebration today. And a few uh, days from now, Allison will be entering into Good Friday. And then Good Friday, we'll be entering into the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's beautiful. And Passion Week represents the last week that Jesus Christ will be on earth. And we know that Palm Sunday uh, represents the triumphant entry of the king. And I love reading this story, and, and, if, you're, and if you just, please, I, I beg of you, if you just lend your mind and your heart and give your soul to the Lord just for the next few minutes, I believe the triumphant entry in these particular uh, Tina passages of scriptures will really begin to speak to us in a different way. This is uh, amazing as we, again, enter into Passion Week because knowing all the things that Jesus is going to have to endure, knowing that eventually he is going to be stretched wide and hung high, I, I want to paint a very graphic illustration. I, I really want your heart and your minds to really meditate on the reality of what Jesus Christ has done. And because of him being able to conquer hell, he's conquered death, he's conquered the grave, but now before all of that can take place, the recognition of him being recognized as king must become a reality. And when we look here in the 21st chapter, and I'm going to begin uh, at verse 1, uh, we get to see something very special that I don't want anybody to miss uh, this morning. Again, we're in Matthew chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. And listen to the word of God uh, this morning. It says that now when they had drew near Jerusalem, and if you know uh, anything about this area, uh, the Jerusalem, and it says here that they came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is directly east of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, uh, and, and, and we even see Bethphage is on the eastern slope uh, of the Mount of Olives, right in the Kidron Valley. And for those that had the opportunity here recently uh, as the Emmanuel to go back to the Holy Land, uh, at the Mount of Olives is a very unique place. And, and you could still, I still uh, encountered Christ on the Mount of Olives. I still uh, felt the presence of God. And, and when we begin to minister and preach from there, it was almost, I heard somebody, uh, one of the pastors uh, from one of the other churches in California say that the word of God went from 2D to 3D to almost 4 4D because now we were able to take the words of Jesus Christ and, and, and really look at our surroundings of what uh, the Lord God uh, has really done. But I, I, I like what's happening here 
because now uh, that he's come to Bethage at the Mount of Olives, and I, I took a rock from there. I got to admit, it's, it's, been, it's, it's been pressing my soul, and I asked the Lord, and, and David, pray for me, and I, 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 it was a rock, and I, and I looked up, and I took my sunglasses off, and this rock, and it was almost like it spoke to me, and I put it in my pocket, and I got on the bus later, and I thought about it even this morning. I said, Lord, forgive me. I stole a rock from the Mount of Olives. I pray that you have mercy and show grace upon me, but I just wanted to take something back from the Mount of Olives. Amen. Pray for your preacher. (laughs) Then Jesus, the Bible says, sent two disciples, get this, saying to them, listen what Jesus is saying, I want you to go into the village. And this village is actually opposite of you, right where you stand. And immediately, right in the intersection, there will be a donkey that will be tied up. He's bound. He, he, he's very limited on his ability to move, but, but, but he's never been ridden on and, and there's something unique about him. And, and when, you, when, you, when you find where this donkey is, I'm going to give you, Jesus says, I'm going to give you very special instructions on what I want you to do from here. You see your response. No, you know, not, not a lot of hallelujahs or, or not a lot of uh, amens. And I, I believe the disciples, even when Jesus told them, uh, they probably had some of the similar and same responses. But what I want you to pay attention to is understand that Jesus is standing, Bethphage, Mount of Olives. He's standing in one city, but can see into another city. Come on, y'all. He's standing in one city. He can see in another city. And not only is he looking in another city that's different from the city that he's standing in, but he sees an animal that he is going to use for his triumphant entry. And, 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 and it, it is a hallelujah moment because I think the mistake that we have as Christians and as the disciples of Jesus Christ is that we don't really give reverence to the Lord for the finite details and the attention to detail that Jesus pays oftentimes. That his attention to detail was so specific, it was so uh, wrapped in prophecy, he was able to see around the corner, uh, he, he, he saw a need for an animal, uh, recognizing that Jesus is king, that he is not only a different type of king, but he's representing a different type of kingdom. That he's standing in one place, but he can see in another and, I, and if we're not careful, hear me good, uh, people of God, uh, it, it, I, I, this is, I, I believe this with everything within me because if we're not careful, we will fail to give Jesus the credit, the praise, and the honor, and the glory for the small things. There's details here. I got from uh, the wedding yesterday and one of our elders, praise God for him and his family, uh, they came and, and showed some love and the first thing that I did right after I got my, my luggage out of the truck is I messaged him and I said, did you and your wife make it home? And he said, yeah, boss, we, we, we made it home. We're good. We're falling asleep and we were, we were going back and forth in text and he stopped texting, which either one, he didn't want to hear my mouth that much at 10 o'clock at night and, or he was real sleepy, probably a combination of both and I understand that, but I wanted to know that they made it home all right and last night over the simple things I said God I give you praise because you brought them home last night like I, 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 I think we miss it because we go uh, through the laundry list of the big praise uh, reports and the things, the big things, almost like a Santa's list that we want uh, Jesus to answer, but we, we, we get caught because, uh, I, I, you know, it, it's not real big, it's not real dynamic, but if you're not careful, you'll miss uh, the opportunity to give Jesus praise in the smallest of detail. Lord, I thank you this morning that you put breath in my body. 
That's, that's, that's me. Uh, Lord, I thank you because uh, uh, my wife didn't have to help me get out the bed this morning. Lord, I give you praise. Jesus, I thank you because I could brush my teeth this morning all by myself. Lord, I thank you I had an automobile to, to take the key and put it in the ignition and it started right up and got me to the church this morning. Lord, I, I, I thank you. I, I wish I had hair, but God, I thank you that you gave me a little bit. The small things. Lord, I, I, I give you praise this morning. I didn't, I didn't come in the church in a wheelchair. I, 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 I'm not having to preach and, and take intermittent breaks because I need oxygen to breathe in and out while I'm preaching. I, I thank God that, that my brothers and sisters made it here this morning. Thank God. Jesus, I praise you. We don't have a big elaborate building with giant doors and a vestibule. Yes, we're in a school, but Lord, I thank you. Lord, Lord, Lord I, I, I thank you. Thank you that you gave me the money to pay my bills on time. God, I thank you that my children are in their right mind. God, I thank you that my grandchildren are in their right mind. Why? Because I understand the, the significance and the importance of thanking Jesus in the small things. The attention to detail that Jesus really pays here is something magnificent and I don't want us again to miss what's happening and not to get caught up in waiting for the Lord to do something big when we can find big in the small come on and say amen and now Jesus the Bible says is going into this village village he's sending them opposite he says immediately you'll find a donkey and a coat with her and listen I want you to loose them and then I want you to do me a favor and bring them to me. Now, now, now listen to me. If, if the Bible says that, that we are, have been created and we have been made, uh, Psalms chapter 8 verse 5, if we have been made a little lower than angels according to the word of God, and that we have dominion over creation, if Jesus could find need in an animal, how much more great of a need could Jesus find in us? Are you with me? What is it that the Lord needs of you this morning? <laughs> what is it? What, what is it? What is it, what, what is it that, that, that purpose, that call, that, that thing that, that kind of has you sitting uh, on the edge of your seat, uh, you kind of stuck, as, as David says, between uh, a rock and a hard place, you, you find yourself in somewhat of a quandary, uh, you live and serve Jesus, really not knowing God, am I serving you, am I in the center of your wheel, am I doing what you've called me to do, are you calling me to do this and I'm doing that, am I moving in the wrong direction and you're moving here, Lord, whatever you do doing I want to be like the donkey if you could find need in the donkey Jesus I'm asking this morning by faith that you would find need in my life I won't I find the need find find the need and 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 and, and notice here that the animal is tied and Jesus says that I want you to loose him and I know that there's time and place and even the Bible gives us spiritual authority to bind uh, those things that are in uh, on earth that had already been bound in heaven Jesus says in Matthew uh, chapter 16 that and he was talking to brother Peter that whatsoever you loose on earth should be loose in heaven but but and I know we're talking about you know loose this and loose that but thank God for being tied up oh are you hearing me thank God for being tied up I, I think about my life and my testimony and and, and, and I think about uh, uh the you know uh, some of my, my friends and I've got a, a good friend of mine who actually took his life last year I've got friends that I went to school with that are behind prison walls that, uh, that I just found out through, through people that I know in the Department of Corrections that they will die in prison, that they will never see the day of life. 
that, 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 that the people and groups that I used to hang with and I've been a part, and I'm going to tell you some of this and I'm going to say this uh, because I'm giving credit to Jesus Christ. So when I tell you these things, some of you might find a different church and that's okay. But, 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 but you know, I, I've, I've been around shootouts and, uh, you know, and I used to tote guns and, you know, we've robbed people and we've beat people up before. And, and I look back over my life, uh, 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 Brother Chapman, and I, and I thank God that he, that he had me tied up because I look at the results of what other people did when I was in the same vicinity, when I was in the same group, and it seemed like that God had a hedge of protection around me. And I look back oftentimes and I say, Lord, I should be in the grave today. Like, like, like I should be the one behind prison walls. I'm the one that, 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 that should be where they are. Why is it that I'm still alive? Why is it that I wasn't shot? How is it that I can go uh, to Iraq in a combat zone and men of valor die around me, but I make it home? How was it that the bullet missed me and hit somebody else? Because God, Jesus himself, had me tied up. And I want you today to give God appreciation for those moments in life where he's tied you up. It seems like everybody else is getting in trouble. It seems like you can never fit in. You want to be a part of the in crowd, but Jesus has had you tied up you couldn't move like everybody else was moving you couldn't uh, do the things that everybody else was doing you you were you were there and present but it seems like God had you protected his love was covering you he saw the greatness in you he saw need in you even when you didn't see need in Jesus Jesus is king he says loose them and bring them to me and if anyone says anything you tell them that the Lord has need of them I want to reassure you and I'm hoping I'm looking everybody in their eyes and everybody online who's watching I don't care how you grew up trailer park ghetto projects without a mama without a daddy with no money with no education these things are irrelevant because Jesus is king do not let your circumstances don't let what you have and what you don't have don't let your up bringing don't let what you've been through stop you from letting you know I come to let you know today with confidence and biblical truth that Jesus Christ the Lord himself has need of you he needs you he needs you but I'm not qualified he'll qualify you (laughs) But I don't, I, don't, I don't cross every T and dot every I. It's okay. He still has need of you. But, 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 but I did this in my past. It's okay. He still has need of you. But, 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 but I was abused as a child, physically and sexually. It's okay. He has need of you. But, but, but I don't know a lot of Bible. It's okay. He has need of you. But I don't know what you know, and I'm, I don't have the boldness and the courage. It doesn't matter. The Lord has need of you. And then he says that all this was done that it might be fulfilled, listen to this, which was spoken by the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion to behold your who? Your who? Your king is coming to you. Lowly, listen how he's coming. Lowly, humble, uh, abased, abased. He, he, he's, he, he's lowly. He, listen, sitting on a donkey. Like he ain't, he ain't, he ain't, Jesus ain't coming through looking like a Budweiser commercial sitting on Clydesdale horses. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Right? He, 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 he's coming in. I, and I don't know how big Jesus was physically in relation to the donkey that he was sitting on, but I imagine every now and then his feet might have did one of those drag numbers and it might have, might have nicked his toe and his, and his feet were very dirty uh, as it was tradition and customary uh, to the Jews that were traveling by feet and, and by donkey and by animal. But it says that he came lowly and that he was sitting on a donkey, a coat, the foal of a donkey. 
And this is prophecy. This is Isaiah, uh, for those who like to take notes and study the word of God. This is Isaiah uh, chapter 62, verse 11, where Isaiah, the major prophet, one of the major prophets of the Old Testament is saying, listen, the king is coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. And there's years and decades and centuries before the king actually shows up. And then Zechariah 9, 9 is also another familiar a parallel passage of scripture because the prophet Zechariah says that not only is his king going to come to you, but there's going to be something in his hand called salvation. Amen. That he's showing up with all power in his hand. <laughs> That, that, that the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi was only a foreshadowing. It was only in anticipation that this king that John the Baptist talked about, this king that Isaiah talked about, this king that Zechariah talked about is actually on the scene. And so the disciples went and they did as Jesus commanded them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and listen to this, they laid their clothes on them, and they set them on them, and a very great multitude spread all of their clothes on the road. And others had been getting to cut down branches from the trees, and they spread them on the road. And then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out. And before you get to the cry, they're giving all of themselves their parchments and their clothes, and they're laying out for Jesus. But it's going to confuse some people, you know, because Jesus is not on the Clodgedale. He's He doesn't have a, a gold crown uh, around his head. He doesn't have hundreds of armor bearers. He doesn't have uh, guards and centurions with, 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 with big uh, swords and shield. But he's got just the people who believe that he's king and, they're, and they've got the, 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 all the, uh, uh, the, the clothes and the, the trees that they've cut down and, 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 and the palms are laid before them. And look at what the cry is the cry is Hosanna to the son of David let me say that again Hosanna to the son of David that word Hosanna in the original language it literally means save us now we 911 we need help we are in the need of a savior that is the moment where Jesus changed my life on a resurrection Sunday in 2009. It wasn't that I spoke in tongues. It wasn't that I jumped up and down and had an outer body encounter. Jesus met me when I realized that I needed saving, not yesterday, not in the future, but I, Hosanna, save me now. I need your salvation. Save my mind, save my heart, save Save my marriage, save my, God, I need you, Hosanna, save us now. That should be the cry in America. Hosanna, 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 save our country. Hosanna, save our schools. Hosanna, save this next generation. Hosanna, save the generation after. Hosanna, prepare our children's children. Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save us now in the highest. And verse 10 says that he had come into Jerusalem and all the city was moved. Who is this? Who is this man y'all keep giving praise to? Who is this man that you've laid out your clothes who is this man where you are laying palms and waving before him? Who is this so-called king, uh, uh, Brother Steve, that everybody is talking about? Who is this man that's causing an uproar, Aaliyah, in the city? Who is this man that, that everybody who is getting everybody's attention? Is this the man where they talked about that even the winds and the seas obey? Is this the name of Jesus that even demons begin to tremble? Is this the name, uh, uh, G is this the man where, that, that causes hell to shake? Is this the man that, that can go up to the blind and call? 
cause them to see again? Is this the man that folks that can't hear that he can just think about it and they can begin to hear? Is this the man where the lame and the maimed that he can begin to touch them and they can stand up and take up their beds and begin to walk again? Is this the man that folks who have been sick for 36 and 38 years that, that he can just say the word and they can begin to walk and give God glory? Is this that king who is Jesus Christ? Yeah, it's him. And they respond in verse 11. Yeah, this is Jesus. Is that the prophet, that old prophet boy from Nazareth? The son of a carpenter? The old Galilean, is, is, is that him? Nah, that can't be him. It's got to be some, I mean, look, I mean, I mean, look, man, this brother rode in on a, on a, on a colt. No, 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 no. Where's the big band and, and all the, the sparkling? Where's the smoke? Where, where's all that? Man, where's, where, 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 come on now. Where, now, this him? Yeah, it's him. And again, I don't, I don't want us as a people, listen to me, to miss God because we're looking for something bigger when Jesus is already big within himself. And I believe the people of God here, they miss their opportunity to be in that place of worship because they, their expectation, there was an expectation gap. They expected Jesus to come one way, but he came lowly and humble. They were expecting this big old parade and big armor bearers and the big show and all the glitz and the glamour and the gold and the red carpet and the musicians and the armor bearers and all of this and that, and, but you missed it. And my prayer this morning for those who are watching online and sitting in the house of the Lord is that you don't miss Jesus when he's on the move. Because you're looking for something greater. When Jesus is caught and interested in the details. Come on, worship. Verse 12. And now this is where it gets real. This is where, where, where you know, Jesus is king. But remember that, that, that when a king takes the throne, now he has to set things in order. Come on and say amen. Don't get quiet on me, Zion. When a king takes charge and when he sits on the throne, he's got to set precedent. He's got to set the standard, Allison. There's got to be a, a left and right limit. There's got to be a standards and expectation. And folks say, man, I, but I thought I could serve Jesus with, with no standards. Let me tell you something. Even McDonald's, nothing against McDonald's, but even McDonald's has a standard. You can't work at McDonald's without a black cap and black trousers and blue shirt and black pants. I, I don't get it. And we become that type of people. And I really feel the Holy Spirit uh, are really doing something in me right now. But we have become a people who are, who are I think, have who really have uh, been confused and bamboozled to think that, that we can say Jesus is king and love on him, but we can live and move how we want to move and do what we want to do. But let me tell you something. Jesus, when he came into my life in that little building on a resurrection Sunday in 09, he began, even Pastor Jones, praise God, he began to prophesy over me. He said, I, I recall it like it was yesterday. He said, the things that will fall off of you like leaves on trees, that Jesus will begin to do something and cause a different hunger inside of you I didn't even go looking for the change the Holy Spirit brought the change in me that 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 there's a standard that there's a there's a calling that Jesus is calling us to and many of us don't realize that that the closer that Jesus allows us to get into his presence the less of your flesh can go the less of you must be left behind because he wants your heart and nothing else that if McDonald's has a standard, why wouldn't the King of King and the Lord of Lords? And Jesus says, listen, he, he went to the temple of God and he drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple. He began to overturn tables of the money changers and he began to flip over the seats who sold doves. When you go back and look at the original language, it says that Jesus even began uh, to tithe. I believe, uh, you know, Southern Baptist boy that I was brought up to be, you know, uh, you didn't want mama or grandmama to say, go get a switch. 
And then they had that three chord where we see even in the book of Ecclesiastes and Tide. And I was like, Lord, please let my grandma whoop me because she ain't as strong as my granddaddy or my daddy. And when grandmama hit me, I'm going to pretend like, <laughs> I'm going to do one of those numbers. Uh, you know, because I, I don't want this again. But it says that Jesus began to whoop folks in the sanctuary. That the king of glory should have been received a different way. That he goes to the temple, I believe, in an opportunity and a moment to worship and celebrate. But instead of being able to to harness the power of worship and celebration, he's got to whoop folks on the behind, turn over seats and tables because of what he sees going on. And, And I've been thinking about this for weeks now. But if Jesus rode up on a donkey to most churches in America, would he would he see an opportunity to worship or celebrate or what would he have to turn over? If Jesus rode up in our church right now, could it could the Lord say, Emmanuel, I'm pleased with you? If Jesus rode up on a coat through those doors where Ronnie's sitting right now, would he turn around and call us a den of thieves? Or would he look upon his father and say, they represent me. If Jesus rode up on a donkey in our church, would he say that those are people that love one another? Are those the people that serve because they choose me as their king? Are those the people that will be bold and not be ashamed and never deny me? Or would he look upon Emmanuel and a lot of our churches, even in our backyard, and call us a dead of thieves? It, that, you know that you know how bad that hurts me but even think that the Lord will look upon us and call us thieves one of the lowest of the lowest is a thief a thief by definition is someone who takes something <laughs> forgive me y'all that doesn't belong to them And my hope today to everyone who's listening is that if Jesus rode up in here and sat among us, that he would call this place a house of prayer. And a lot of us have destroyed the sanctity and the holiness of the house of God. We come here for social events. We come here to be nosy. Some of us just come because we've been doing it since we were this, this age and this height. We do it because we're south of the Mason-Dixon line and the thing that we do around Palm Sunday and Passion Week and Resurrection and Easter and Christmas is go to church. But my hope and desire is that when the Lord looks upon us that he knows without a shadow of a doubt that this is a house of prayer, that we are people that pray without ceasing that we are people that love even in spite of, that we are people that pursue because we understand that Jesus is king. What would Jesus call us on today? And then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and the Bible says that Jesus heals them. It's not hard for Jesus to heal. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw these wonderful things that Jesus was doing, it even caused the children The children, the children, beautiful. The children, the children, Bo, and all the other babies, the children. See, Jesus is not only for the grown folks, but he's also in the business of being blessed and moved by the children. And it says here that even the children cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. But now these scribes and Pharisees, they were indignant and said, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus says, yeah, I hear them. I hear them Lima Charlie is what we say in the army. I hear them Lima Charlie. I hear them loud and clear. Why? 
because of the babies and the infants, I perfected even a praise in their belly. I perfected a praise in the belly of these children. And this should give us hope. This is a good place to, to shout and say amen and clap our hands because Jesus is speaking to the next generation. Jesus is saying that, yeah, the enemy's been turned loose, but remember, it's under my control. I'm still sovereign. I'm still king of king. I'm still Lord of lords. Read Revelation. Read the end of the book. Gog and Magog, tribulation, it won't matter. I am still the king of king and the Lord of lords. Or did you forget? I perfected a praise in the belly of these babies to carry on for the next generation and the next generation will cry out Hosanna 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 to the son of David. The next generation. And it starts with us, with these babies to remind them that God has need of them and that praise Jesus has already perfected. Then the Bible says he left them, he went out the city to Bethany and he finally lodged. Meaning Jesus, Jesus checked me into a hotel. And I tease oftentimes because when you look at the public ministry of Jesus, it's like he's homeless. He really doesn't have an address or a residence because he's omnipresent, he's everywhere all the time. So I want you to remember on this beautiful Palm Sunday that it's easy for us to miss the greatness of Christ because we're looking for this big thing. When the big thing is in the humility, it's in his suffering, it's in, it's in his compassion, it's in his sacrifice, it's in his love, and it's in his praise. Don't ever forget that. Stop looking for the big and praise God in the small. Then when the big comes, you can still praise him even the more. Are you with me? Come on and give God praise. Hallelujah. Standing all over the room. Come on, stand to your feet. Thank God for what he's done and what he continues to do. Please don't miss Jesus in the smallest and the greatest of detail. We celebrate him today as king. And even as we're led into resurrection, one of my favorite times of the year, understand that the crucifixion, it's graphic, it's gruesome, it's, it's ugly, it's, it's, it's shameful, but there's power there. And if we can remember that Jesus is king, it changes everything. I want us to walk out of here today and cut the video off on YouTube or wherever you shared it or watching it and understand that he's king. Write that on the tablet of your hearts. Put it on the forefront of your mind. It'll change your worship and how you worship him. It'll change the way you serve him. It'll remove the skewed view of who you think Jesus is versus who he actually has called himself to be. Changes your study, changes how you view the word. Why? Because Jesus is king.